I'd like to start by asking you what you think of this shoe. What is it? Who do you think it might belong to? How would you begin to make those judgments? What, what would help you find that out? Is it likely to be a shoe of someone recently? Is it likely to be a shoe of someone a long time ago? I want you to start thinking about that and thinking about what you could argue. So, it's likely this is a shoe of a boy who lived a long time ago, and it likely looks like the shoe of a small child. If we change the angle of the shoe, we can extend our thinking a little bit further. Um, you know, maybe it looks about 60 to 70 years old. Um, what's the colour like? What's the condition like? Well, it looks faded, worn, slightly crumpled. It looks aged. Um, the style, many would describe it as potentially being old fashioned. It doesn't look like it has the appearance of children's shoes today. And perhaps it looks like the style of kind of a miniature adult's shoe. It's got laces rather than Velcros or zips. Um, and that's not really the case anymore. We often have Velcro on children's shoes. So lots of these things are telling us that it's a shoe from a long time ago. Um, and it's a shoe that was made to last for somebody. It wasn't kind of in this society like we have today where we get new shoes every every year or so. This shoe was supposed to last a very, very long time. So in terms of thinking about who might have owned this shoe, it doesn't really help us at all because, you know, this shoe could have been owned by anybody in history. So there's one more thing I'm going to show you in helping us work out who owned this shoe. This shoe was found in Auschwitz-Birkenau. This was a death camp and the shoe was owned by a child who was killed there. So we're about to start our new topic and our new topic is the Holocaust. Now this is an extremely important unit of work um, and it's very, very significant. Um, and I'm gonna go into a bit more detail in a minute after I tell you a little story um, about what comes into this topic and why we have to be so mature when we learn about it. But I'm gonna tell you a little story first of all. Okay, so this is the girl I want to tell you about. She's standing right behind me, next to me. Her name is Tara Westover, okay? And the first time she heard the word Holocaust, she was 17 years old and was sitting in her first semester of school at Brigham Young University in the United States of America. It wasn't just her first semester of term or even of the year. It was the first time she had ever sat in a school classroom and read anything that wasn't religious or a Christian text. As she sat in her class on Western art, she saw the word Holocaust in italics under an image in her textbook. And she asked her professor, what does it mean? She describes the, the silence that followed as almost violent. After the lecture, people said to her, you shouldn't make fun of that. It's not a joke. Even the lecturer replied with a snide comment. Thanks for that. It seems unbelievable that Tara really didn't know what the Holocaust was. She immediately went to the computer lab at school and taught herself about the Holocaust. As soon as she discovered what it was, she realized why the silence had followed her had been quite so violent, why people had been so angry that she'd maybe look like she made a joke about this topic. For Tara, this was the moment she realized the holes in her own education. She had been homeschooled by her Mormon family in a mountain range in Idaho. She knew in detail the ins and outs of Mormon belief, but remarkably little about real life or, her, or the society her family lived apart from. She left the family and went on to study in Cambridge, which is where she is here, um, and Harvard, an example of how dedicated she was to learning despite the significant barriers in her upbringing. Now Tara really has nothing to do with the Holocaust, but her journey in discovering what it meant was poignant to me, trying to show you how vital it is that we understand it, along with its relevance in today's society. You need to know what it is, what it meant, and what it still means to huge swathes of people in order to to talk intelligently and emotively about this topic if it does arise in your studies, in conversation or in discussions with others. 
We're going to learn about the Holocaust for these last four weeks of school. We'll look at what it is, sorry, what it was, um, where it came from, and why people went along with it. And I'm going to give you a brief overview now before um, we start in our real kind of lessons getting into the bottom of what it was. So the Holocaust was the mass murder of six million Jews in Germany during the Second World War. Around 500,000 Romani gypsies were also murdered and countless, other, countless others suffered at Hitler's hands. This is what we call a genocide. Genocide is the targeted killing of a certain group because of their race, ethnicity or religion. You have to remember that whilst we don't live in a perfect society today, um, and I am by no means saying we are free from racism or prejudice, Europe was much more judgmental um, in the 1900s. Racism was much more prevalent and lots of people were resentful towards certain groups. Racism means prejudice or discrim being discriminatory to someone because of their race. Um, and this doesn't apply to the treatment of Jews. The word we use to describe prejudice or hostility towards Jews is anti-Semitism. And this is something which still exists today. However, it was rife in Europe in the early 1900s, um, the time leading into the Second World War. So it's in this backdrop that we want to start learning about what happened. Um, we're going to start looking at how anti-Semitism developed and escalated in Europe. So why this kind of um, prejudice and unfair judgment started growing bigger and bigger against this group of people, the Jews um, in Europe. We'll look at Germany specifically and how the lives of Jewish citizens started to become significantly affected. Uh, we'll look at treatment in terms of you know, where they were allowed to live and what happened to them. And eventually we'll look at what happened um, at the end of the, of the timeline um, that led to you know, the mass murder of, of people. Um, we will end the whole unit by looking at how the world remembers this event um, and the lengths that different societies have gone to to try and educate next generations on this awful and hugely significant event. Now, this is a, a really difficult topic to teach and to learn, um, and it's difficult to teach you in school, let alone virtually. So I need us all to approach this with a really big level of maturity, um, because obviously it's highly significant, it's highly emotional, and it's so, so, so important that we get this right. Um, I recently went on a trip to Jerusalem and I went to the Yad Vashem Museum, uh, which is where they have produced an amazing museum um, to, to the Holocaust and the victims of the Holocaust. And what's behind me is actually the museum memorial, I guess, to, to the murdered Jews of Europe. And it's a really, really, really amazing memorial. It's really, really large. And all these photographs are of all the individual people. So one more thing I'd like to ask of you as we do learn about this is that I think there's a tendency to look at numbers and to think of the number six million and think, wow, that's so many people. But to kind of lose the essence of what each individual person actually was and who they were, because every single one of those numbers was an entire person in their own right, who had their own story, their own personality and their own life that was taken from them. You know, every single one of those was a daughter, a son, a mother, a brother, something to someone. Um, and I think it's really, really important that we, we try to hold on to um, as much of the individuality and the humanity of this rather than, you know, sit back a little bit, which is very, very easy to do when we look at emotional topics um, and just think about, you know, the numbers and things like that. Something that I would really suggest you do to try to kind of keep that connection going with individual people is read a book um, if you can get hold of one on the topic. Now, I'm going to run you through a couple of really good suggestions. Um, I've read most of these. I read lots and lots of books on this topic as I grew up. I was really interested in learning more about it. Um, and I can recommend personally some of these books. So I'm going to start with um, some of the easier readers. So these are kind of easier reader books. And we've got Odette's Secrets, which is in the middle, this one here, by Marion MacDonald. I've got When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit, over here by Judith Kerr. This is a really famous book. Um, and if you want to start somewhere, I'd probably start with that one if you want kind of an easier reader. So um, we're looking at kind of, you know, 
10, 11 years old reading age. Um, and then The Silver Sword by Ian, I can't quite make out his surname, my apologies, but um, the surname of the author is up there and it's called The Silver Sword. Right, these books are a little bit more challenging in terms of reading, um, but again, I've actually read all of these myself and they're all really, really excellent. So we've got Once by Maurice Gleitzman, um, really, really good book, that one. Um, very, very famous, The Diary of Anne Frank. We're going to actually be doing some work on this at the end of our four-week course, written by um, a young girl about her time in hiding in an attic uh, where she was hiding from the Germans. And finally, this is my favorite book of all time. Um, really one of the most read books I have. I just think it's the most beautiful story. Um, I Will Plant You a Lilac Tree by Laura Hillman. In summary, she um, is, um, I can't remember, I think she's about 14, 15 or 16 years old during the Holocaust. And she's sent to a concentration camp with her family and she ends up meeting someone there. Um, and obviously they're in the camp for a number of years and they kind of grow a romantic relationship. And after the war, they, they um, probably shouldn't tell you that because it's gonna ruin the story. Read the book, it's amazing. Um, a really beautiful story of kind of humanity and hope in the face of, you know, horror really. Okay, and then finally, these are kind of more challenging even still. So these books I'd recommend for kind of reading ages of kind of 16, 17 at least. Um, and we've got The Book Thief, which is quite a thick book. Um, they've, they've made a film about that, you might have seen it. It's a really good story about um, a, a little girl realizing that in her house there was some, you know, a Jewish man who was hiding there. <coughs> uh, we've got The Librarian of Auschwitz and The Tattooist of Auschwitz. This book here um, by Heather Morris has reached quite a lot of fame recently. Um, again, that's a good book. And she's also written another one called Silker's Journey, which is also quite good. I've read both of them. Um, but there we go. Some really good books there if you if you want to read a personal story. Now, why I, the reason I like these books is that they're all personal stories. They're one individual or a couple of individuals story of what happened. So I really think it connects you with that idea of humanity and the individualness of this. Um, and it really takes you through it through somebody's viewpoint and you kind of feel their journey. You feel the story through their eyes. And I think that's the best way of us connecting with this on a really human level. So my advice would be to pick one of those books, pick the either the easy, the, the middle or the hardest category um, that matches up with what you think your reading age is and how, you know, the kind of books that you read um, and see if you can get hold of it. I know, you know, libraries aren't particularly open right now, but you might be able to order it um, on Amazon if, if, you, if you have the ability to do that or see if you've got one around the house already. Just see if you can get hold of one because they are really, really excellent. Right, I also wanted to talk about a couple of films. Now, these films I'm gonna start with are actually age 15. So make sure that you um, either get permission from a parent, you watch it with a parent or guardian, or you obviously are 15 years old before you watch this. But these are probably my favorites um, of the slightly older age category of film. So we've got Defiance, which is a really amazing film about um, a resistance group who resisted against the Germans, a Jewish resistance group. We've got Schindler's List, um, probably the most famous Holocaust film of all time. Um, and this obviously follows the story of Oskar Schindler, who set up a factory, who was a German, set up a factory. Um, eventually, by the end of the film, I'm not gonna fill in all the blanks, you need to watch it yourself if you want to know what happens. But he ends up being able to help um, a huge number of people um, and it's a really 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 emotional film and finally the pianist which follows the story of this character um, who lives in a ghetto which is an enclosed area where the Jews are moved to a bit later on in the war and he actually escapes and he goes into hiding and it follows his journey and his story okay so they're slightly older range of films which I think are really good Okay, and all of these films are age 12. So again, you need to get parental permission, but they're probably a bit more suited um, to you guys at the moment. Um, I'm gonna start here. Now, this is a really old film, but it's uh, an incredibly beautifully filmed film. Um, Life is beautiful. We move along to this one, Boy in the Striped Pajamas. You may have heard about that. We see the character here, 
who is the son of one of the commandants, the people who ran one of the concentration camps, um, and what happens to him when he makes a friendship with one, with one of the Jewish prisoners. Um, we've got this one, Operation Finale, which is actually on Netflix. Um, so you don't need to get hold of that one if you have Netflix subscription. And that's about um, a group that tracked down one of the people who did some bad things during the Holocaust after uh, a bit later on in later years. And finally, this film, Denial, where it's about the idea of, of did the Holocaust really happen? Um, we know that it did, and it's a crime to say that it didn't to do this denial, um, but they've made a film about that. So there's some films which are also maybe a bit more targeted to your age range. Um, I just remembered you can also look up The Book Thief, which I mentioned before. Um, that's an age 12, I think, as well. So I just wanted to give a little overview before we get started and get kind of get into this to give you some background, um, some books to read, some films to watch if you do want to get a bit of more information. But we're about to start on this journey. So it's the, the genocide, the, the murder because of their who they were of Jewish people living in Germany and then in Europe when the Germans um, conquered parts of Europe in the Second World War. And that's our next unit of work. 